Well, hallelujah. hallelujah. I'll never forget I was in Cleveland back about 25 years ago on the way back from a men's conference here at Hegelwish. And I wanted to see and meet Dimitri Dudeman. And that's how he started out. He got up behind the pulpit and he screamed, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I said, wow, I like this guy. <laughs> Anybody met Dimitri Dudeman? I'm the only one, huh? What a privilege. It's like hugging Win Worley. If you didn't hug Win Worley, uh, you're at a loss. So uh, good to be here. I appreciate being behind Pastor Mike Thurer's pulpit and uh, the Hegewish men uh, being behind him and so forth. And uh, I don't see anybody on oxygen. Anybody here on oxygen? Anybody here have to get wheelchaired in? And that's okay. But most of you look pretty healthy. Isn't it good to be an American? I love this. I love this country. I love my country. I'm a patriot, and uh, and I enjoy this country. And all you got to do is go to a third world country like I've been to, and you'll. When I came back to, from the Philippines to LAX, I literally went to the to the re, to the restroom. Uh, I keep on confusing Canada's washroom, uh, and I kissed the ground. Now some guy walked in on me. I felt embarrassed, but I said hello. I said, I know I'm in the land of fruits and nuts. With all the nuts, with the country tipped and the nuts rolling down that end. If you're from California, uh, my heart goes out to you. And I'm not, I don't want to offend you, but listen, Chico, California, city council, listen, you won't get it. Enacted a ban on nuclear weapons. And they said, if you set off a nuclear weapon within our city limits, it's a $500 fine. <laughs> I told you, California, land of fruits and nuts. A convict, bro listen to this one. A convict broke out of jail. Whoops, that's not the one I want. I want California. An L.A. man, a Los Angeles man who later said he was tired of walking, stole a steamroller. And he led police on a five-mile-an-hour race. You can't make this stuff up. So the police chased him for a while, and then one of them had a V8 moment and just stopped his cruiser, walked up, and got on board with him and arrested him. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. Anyway. I am so thankful. Aren't you glad you can taste? First, that's 5.18 says, it is the will of God that we give thanks. If you want to do something, you know what God wants you to do? Be thankful. Just be thankful. Many of you love coffee, right? Aren't you thankful for a good cup of coffee in the, in the, in the morning? Especially when it's chilly in the house still, because you just put the heat on, right? I'm thankful for soap, because I get close to people. I can imagine, imagine Jesus just had to deal with the smells. Comes from a pristine heaven at the right hand, from the right hand of the Father, and he's got to smell us. Can you imagine with, that, with just, just that alone? Forget it, Right? Do you stop and smell the roses? I do. My wife does. Take time. Slow down. Right? The day you die, and each one of us has an expiration date, the day you die, the world's not going to stop. All that matters is what? Glorifying God and enjoying him forever. Correct? Let's get into the word. How many have their Bibles? <clears throat> I want to talk about unshackled from past failures. Anybody here bugged by their past? You can't seem to get it out of your mind. It's like haunting you and haunting you and haunting you and haunting you. In an interview with the Rolling Stone magazine, singer Elton John reflected on his father. Here's what he said. 
He says they wouldn't hold you. They wouldn't say they loved you. I was afraid of my father. I was walking on eggshells the whole time trying to get his approval. Anybody here identify with that? He's been dead for a long time. And I'm still trying to prove things to him. End quote. Asked what he meant, Elton replied in the Rolling Stone interview, I still do things, and I say to myself, Dad, you would have loved this. Elton's father died from England, English, died in 1997 without seeing him play a live performance. I don't agree with his music. I don't agree with him as a homosexual. But I feel sorry for him, don't you? His father physically touched him the most when he was beating him. Elton said, and I quote, my mom, my mom always says, just, son, that's the way we did it in those days. And it didn't affect you. True or false? False. False. Elton closed this interview, and I'd say, what are you talking about, Mom? It affects me every day. Raise your hand if you can identify with that. Yeah. Generational curses really mess us up. By the way, do, am I the only messed up person here? And if you don't believe I'm messed up, just talk to my wife. In fact, forget I said that. But I'm thankful she's here. I'm thankful she follows me. And um, doesn't beat me up too bad. No, I praise God for my bride. We've been married 43 years. And uh, we dated six. We met in high school. And on my honeymoon, I told her, honey, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. <laughs> so she hasn't left yet. Anybody having problems here? I mean, you get problems in your life. Yeah, well, that's why you're here, right? The church is the hospital for saints, right? That's why you go to church, people. Because you're a mess, and you need to be unmessed, right? Unshackled from past failures. One of my other mentors, uh, when I was a student in uh, postgraduate school, Dr. Howard Hendricks, I highly respected the man, as much as Pastor Worley, as much as others I've met over the years. But the late Dr. Hendricks said in one of our classes, he says, most of us don't plan to fail. We, play, we, we fail to plan. Most of us do not plan to fail. We fail to plan. If, God forbid, your house were to burn down, Monday, you woke up out of a sound sleep, and there's only one thing you could take with you, assuming your family got out alive. There was only one thing you could take with you, what would it be? And if you had a choice between your Bible or your wallet, what would you run to? Ladies, purses. That tells a lot about you, sir. That tells a lot about you, ma'am. Just one thing. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10, please. As we look at the Word of God in the time we have left. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. I have a little bit different, you know, uh, pedagogue style. I like, um, I like turning to the scriptures, get people in the word. That's one thing I hate about these mega churches. They got these old screens up here with the Bible on them. 
You don't have to bring your Bible to church. You should be marking up your Bible because a worn out Bible belongs to someone who isn't. Amen? 1 Corinthians 10, verses 8 and 11. Let's read it together. This is the word of God. Paul says to Timothy, <clears throat> startling words. This, is, this I'm quoting 2 Timothy. That the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any... Oops, wrong one. That's the second one. The first one, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for... Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and rightness, righteousness, right living, that the man, that the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then Paul, who I think wrote Hebrews, by the way, could be Barnabas, but I think it's Paul, in Hebrews 4, reminds us that the word of God is what? Living and powerful. Yeah, the Bible should be right now like a Mexican jumping beam, jumping up in your lap and it's, it really is in the spirit realm, probably, because it's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents, intentions of the human heart. This is the word of God, 1 Corinthians 10 eight. Read it with me, please. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in how many days? One day. Just one. And verse 11, 1 Corinthians 8, whoops, whoops, 10 and verse 11, I'm sorry. I just read verse 8, turn to 10, 11. He says, now these things happened to them, to the Israelites, to the children of Israel, as what? As an example. I think some of your translations read in sample. Meaningless word to me because I don't even use the word. But example is really what it means. And they were written for whose instruction? For our instruction. Upon whom the ends of our ages have come. Paul expected the Lord to come in his lifetime. Why? Because of the doctrine of the imminency of Jesus Christ returned. He could have come, right? He didn't. It's been over 2,000 years. We're still waiting. But he can come at any moment. You may not have to get deliverance tonight and healing and mass deliverance, group deliverance, healing. Because the Lord may come by then. It's any moment it can happen. And I'm excited. Any moment. Listen, a key reason that God the Holy Spirit inspired the Old Testament writers to include the successes and the failures of Israel is for us to learn to not make the same stupid choices. Now, you're driving down the road, right? Never been in the area. But there's a sign you say that you see that says bridge out. What are you going to do? Stop! You don't keep on proceeding when there's a bridge out sign. It's a warning for you, correct? So the New Living Translation says these things happen to them as an example for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the ends of the age. So people, we're supposed to pay attention when we're reading God's word. Don't make the same stupid mistake. Don't do that. And by the way, you know, the, you know what they were doing while Moses, Moshe, was on the top of the mount meeting God face to face? People in human history, that club is very small. His face shone afterwards, people. He had put a veil on it because people, you couldn't take the light. And guess what the children of Israel were doing? They were having an idolatrous orgy. Their clothes were off, and there was a sexual orgy. And God had every right to strike them all dead. But how many did he kill in one day? How many? 23,000. Sounds like a lot to us, right? The whole Vietnam War, there's only 55,000 people died. It's half the Vietnam War casualties. But think about that. God actually had a right to kill everybody. 
start over again. But thank God for grace. Amen? Let's turn to Genesis 27. We're going to be there most of the time. I want to, I want to camp there. Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. Go back to the book of beginnings, Genesis. And let's turn to chapter 27. We're going to read verses 1 to 5a, which is the first part of the verse. Genesis chapter 27, 1 to 5a. Sheep, here we go. And shepherds, a few shepherds here. This is the word of God. Now it came about when Yitzhak, Isaac, was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son. And he said to him, to his father, here I am. And Isaac, Yitzhak, said, behold, now I am old and I don't know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare a savory dish for me, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. Psst, psst, psst. Who was listening? Who? Who? But Rebecca was listening while Isaac spoke, Yitzhak spoke to his son, Esau. Rebecca, well, what would we call it today? Rebecca had what? Big ears. Yeah. It's amazing. When I'm talking about a, trying to hide a birthday, excuse me, talk to my daughter about a birthday cake for my bride. Uh, her ears turn like elephant ears. I'm down in the basement, right? When I'm standing right next to her and I say something, she doesn't hear me. <laughs> Will anyone explain that to me, please? In fact, if you're a man, I'll give you my pulpit time. No problem. Because I've yet to figure that out. One other thing I can't figure out is why do they have Braille at a drive-up ATM? If anybody can figure that out for me, tell me. And if you read Braille and you're driving up a car, driving a car up to an ATM, uh, please tell me what ATM you're using, because I don't want to be anywhere near you. <laughs> no offense, I'll hug you when I see you, but get out of the car first. In fact, I'll be seeing you. You will not be seeing me. Otherwise, you wouldn't be using Braille in any event. It's good to hear the saints of God laugh. Right? We have a fun... Uh, the only reason I go to church is because I never know what the Holy Spirit's going to do. I don't. I really don't. I mean, I plan ahead and I study and so forth, but uh, I don't know what, he's, what, 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 God's, what the Lord's up to. But he does, and that's all I need to know. Amen? And that's all you need to know. That's why you come to church. That's why you, you're here. And as Pastor Mobley's been so faithful coming out to speak in my place in New York that, uh, you know, you never know when the Lord's going to heal you of something. That you're just sitting there being faithful and bang, all of a sudden, it's gone. Isn't that good? Most of us are already familiar with this, uh, the life of Isaac and Rebecca. I don't know what size nose Rebecca had, right? She was Jewish. I'm part Jewish too, so no offense. But she sure had big ears, proverbially. But both parents failed in that they did what many of us are doing here today and have done. You know what it is? Excuse me, who said that? Thank you. I love people who are a step ahead of me, right? <laughs> You know, I wasn't the brightest knife in the drawer, or the sharpest knife in the drawer, or the brightest bulb. But most of us, I think, are relatively smart enough to know that playing favoritism is not a good idea, right? So why do we still do it? Right? 
Oh, I loved my Aunt Joanne, and my daughter looks like Aunt Joanne. <laughs> right, so, Aunt, so your daughter gets all the attention. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Don't. What would you call it? The favorite child game? It's like Monopoly, but worse. And by the way, never play Monopoly with me because I'm a sore loser. And when you start winning Park Place and all those, the, the, the board's off the table. I know, I need deliverance from that, don't I? Yitzhak's favorite was who? Who was Isaac's favorite? That's right. Boy, he loved his venison, didn't he? Do we have any venison lovers here? Phil, I thought your hand would go up. You're from Michigan. Everybody hunts up there. Venison? Venison? Gary? Oh. Glad to know Gary's not a sissy. He's a hunter. <laughs> Who was Rebecca's favorite? Yeah, it's not all that hard, people. I mean, it's just, you know. Jacob. The second younger twin brother. Verse 4, did you see it? 27, verse 4. And prepare a savory dish for me, such as I love, that my soul may bless you before I die. People, who's supposed to get the blessings? Yeah, God says, God's word says what? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I? Which really means not chosen. I didn't chose him to be the, the, in the lineage of the blessings. Was there a problem here? Yeah, go like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go back to 25 and verse 23. Look at 25 and 23. 25 and 23. God says, this is the word of God. Then Yahweh said, whenever it's all capital, capital L-O-R-D, it's Yahweh. Whenever it's capital L, small r-d, it's Adonai. And then Yahweh said to her, to her, that is to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb, two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve thee. Yeah. People, God had prophesied. God had already said, my chosen is Yaakov, is Jacob. So Isaac was essentially going against the word of God and the God of the word by taking matters into his own hands. You ever done that? What happens when you've taken matters into your own hands? Right? The Holy Spirit said, you see, you know, he started tugging your shirt sleeve. Leave me alone. I know what I'm doing, right? Gee, how'd that work out? Right? That's why Paul says, walk by means of the Spirit so that you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And by the way, did, um, did, did, uh, did Daddy have a problem? Did Isaac have a problem with... Uh, with uh, lust for food, right? I should never bring this up in the Midwest, right? Because there's probably no one seated here who doesn't have a problem with lust for food, right? The favorite sin of the church, gluttony, right? And we all are, we all to, we're all to blame, right? If you're like me, you hear donuts calling your name, correct? Pastor John, Pastor John. What? It's cream filled. Right? Then you try to resist after you've driven around the donut shop five times. <laughs> I'm not too good at resisting here. Right? Lust for food. Any problem? Well, come against it tonight. Hit them tonight. Hate and repent. Hate the sin. Repent, right? Let's read verse 5 where we left off to verse 16. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home, Rebekah said to her son Yaakov, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a savory dish for me that I may eat and bless you in the presence of the Lord of Yahweh before your death, before my death. Now therefore, my son, listen to me as I command you, 
Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats. She's a good cook. She made goats taste like venison. That I may prepare them as a savory dish for your father, such as he loves. And then you shall bring it to your father, that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. I'm, uh, I got smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me, then I'll be a deceiver in his sight. She's got more, he's got more common sense than his mother does. And I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. You know, curses are still as real as blessings. Get a copy in the book room. Derek Prince, Blessing a Curse. You can choose. Pastor Mike talked about it last night. But his mother said, you, your curse be on me. Everybody say, uh-oh. Well, that's not everybody. Ready? Let's try it again. It's not that hard, right? Anybody here from California? All right. Uh-oh. I didn't say to laugh. I just said say uh-oh. I'm only kidding. It's good to hear you laugh. Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and... His mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau. He's been out of the house for, you know, 20 some odd years now. Her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Yaakov, Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the young goats on the hands and on the smooth parts. She, you know, oh, pretty clever, huh? Pretty creative. On his hands and the smooth part of his neck. People of God, Rebecca was conniving and scheming. Scheming and what? Conniving. On behalf of her favorite boy, Jacob. I mean, while she was right in the, it, she was in the right in terms of God's, what's going to happen, God prophesied and God promised. But she was anxious and not willing to trust the way God was going to do it. And in his flawless timing, her impatience and anxiety was dripping off these verses. Did you feel it? Go get the new goats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta get the. Can you feel it? Have you ever noticed that when you're driven by anxiety and fear? Usually you make bad mistakes. Yeah, some of you women got the wrong husband. Am I right? Nobody's, everybody, you don't want to be slugged. You don't want to be, don't, you don't say amen to that out loud. Right? You think amen. Right? I have bad news. You can't bring him back to Walmart and trade him in. They don't want you to trade him. Right? The good news is you can make a bad marriage a good marriage with Jesus, right? Correct? But you got to change. See, our problem is we like everybody else to change, right? You change, and I want you to change, and you change, and you change, and you change. But I don't have to change much because I'm pretty good. Right? In fact, I'm hot stuff. I don't need to change. Leave me alone. Now, you know what God's willing? God is more, right? If you have a basement floor, don't do it in your apartment building. But if you take a piece of chalk and go down to your basement, draw a circle around and say, Lord, change the person within this circle and mean it. And when God hears that, he'll say, bingo, I've been waiting for that, and that's why for the past 10 years it's been a living hell because I've been waiting for you to surrender. To tell me that I need to change the most, because you do, and that don't change everybody else, change me so other people do, doesn't bother me anymore. Amen? Because that's spiritual maturity, people. I've always, I, people, I've learned the hard way. I've been smacked up by, with a four by four across my head by the Holy Spirit. And I say that because my ministry of 30 years is littered with people 
that I've tried to change. And many of them don't want to change. And all I've done is bloody my head against with the four by four. They don't want to change. Anybody identify with that? Yeah. Why? Because we all have free will people. You get free will. I've got free will. Now, when you get the demons out, this, your will's a little bit freer. But we all have free, a certain amount of free will. And we all make choices, and our choices make us. Remember that. Don't be as interested as, as interested in changing everybody else as God changing you. Amen? They're not the problem. You are. In fact, your biggest enemy is not Satan or demons. You heard it from here, and I've been fighting them for 30 years. Well, in my 29th year, 30 years of ministry. Your biggest problem is who? Not Phil Walma. He's my biggest problem. No, I'm only kidding. Just checking if Phil's awake. He, he looks happy now. No, your, your biggest, my, John Gogan's biggest problem is John Gogan. Say, why do you say that? Because I opened the door for what the enemy can do to me deleteriously. And so do you. Amen? I'm just telling you like it is, people. Don't shoot me. I'm just paying you to get the newspaper. You know, you don't get a newspaper. Hey, this is bad news on the front page. <coughs> right? I'm only a newsboy. I'm just giving you news. But I've learned over the years when I've made rash decisions, uh, huge mistakes usually follow. When I take my time and be patient and and, and, and long-suffering, and right? I love, the, I love the word long-suffering. What do you think it means? Not too fast now. <laughs> Most of us are from California. Long-suffering. See, we don't like to suffer long. Thank God the Savior did. Amen? Look at verse 11. We read it, Jacob answered, answered his mother, Rebecca, Behold, he saw my brother. And he, has, he makes more common sense than she does. She says, but his mother said to him, your curse be on me. No good. No good. Are you aware that husbands and dads have been given tremendous authority by God over their wives, over the wife and children? Just write this down. Numbers 30 Verse 3, verse 5, and verse 8 says that a daddy can break a vow before God by a daughter. People, that's it. God, and God recognizes it and adheres to it. Numbers 30, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 8. However, when the daughter gets married, that authority transfers to who? The husband. But Jacob knew about a father's authority to bless or curse those under his charge. And the worst thing is his own mom's response, that if a curse is spoken against him, let it be come on me. People, you never do that. Don't ever be that dumb. By the way, the scheme's carried out. How about... Right about now, how do you think Esau is feeling about it? Because you know what happens, right? The blessing goes to Jacob. Because Isaac, his eyesight's not that good. I'm not going to belabor the point. Jacob ends up with the blessing. Now, Esau's coming back from the long hunt. Do you think anybody, any hunters here who, who got tired by the time they came back in? Yeah. So he arrives home and, all right, Daddy, I'm ready. You're ready? What do you mean you're ready? I've already blessed you. Anybody ever here been ripped off by anybody? Raise your hand. No details. Any, I want to see those hands. Let me ask you a question. How did it feel? Awful. What kind of other adjective? Terrible. You felt betrayed.
That's exactly how Esau feels. Chapter 27, verse 46. Let's run over there, please. Chapter 27 and verse 46. She has to send him off to her brother, Uncle Laban, because Esau's ready to kill him. And she doesn't want deaths of two boys. They may kill each other. And Rebecca said to Yitzhak, this is the word of God, I'm tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. Don't say you're tired of anything because you'll get tired. Those spirits will come into you. Break it. Break the curse in Jesus. Self-inflicted curse in Jesus' name. Just say, all right, I've had enough and I need to pray about this. Don't say you're tired. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Hath like these, from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? You know that she never saw her boy again? Alive. The very thing that she was trying to do for her favorite, never saw him again. And you remember the story. He goes to Uncle Labum. Guess who, who gets ripped off? Well, it goes around. It's the eternal law of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. What you sow yesterday, you're reaping today. What you reap, sow today, you're going to reap on Thursday. So be careful of what you're sowing. Right? So Jacob sent away. What happens? Turn to Genesis 32. I don't have much time left. Genesis chapter 32. People, by this time, a lot of water has gone over the dam in Jacob's life. And you know what happens. He gets ripped off from his uncle with the wife he wanted, Rachel, Rachel in Hebrew, who ends up getting Leah. Well, one day, Jacob's coming out, excuse me, Esau's coming out to meet him. What do you think Jacob's thinking about now? Look at verse 6. And the message is returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau. He sent out an advanced team to see, uh-oh, what kind of mood's he in? Is this my last days on earth? And furthermore, he's coming to meet you. Everyone say, uh-oh. And 400 men are with him. Uh-oh, double uh-oh. <laughs> right? Then Yaakov was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him so not everybody would be killed, and the flocks and the herds and the camels. God tremendously blessed him while he was there at Laban's into two companies. For he said, if Esau comes to the one company, attacks it, then the other company will be feel free to escape. And what does Jacob do? The smartest thing he's ever done at this point, verse 9, he goes to prayer. People, when everything's falling apart, get on your knees and lift up your hands and say, uh, I need help. God, I need help. In the mighty name of your son, Christ Jesus, please help me. Aren't you glad that Jesus prayed for you today, has been praying for you today at the right hand of the Father? Ever making intercession, Paul says, what? There is one mediator between God the Father and men. It is who? The man Christ Jesus. Man, I've been in so much bad pickles. And I know the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ who got me out of them. And the same things happened to you. Jesus says in Luke, if two or more agree on touching anything, he says, my father will hear and answer. Remember that. Never forget that he goes to prayer. He says, O God of my father, Abraham, and God of my father, Isaac, Yitzhak, O Yahweh, who said to me, return to your country. It's time to go back. And to your relatives, and I will prosper you. I am unworthy. People, what's that? Humility. About three years ago, a demon, we were, in, we were interrogating and casting out. We have paper bags at the church because we didn't, sometimes it overflows the paper towels. And they say, we hate these bags because people put their heads in them and humble themselves. 
We hate these bags. Listen closely. Never forget this. Never, ever forget this. This is what he told us. Because we are powerless against humility. Did you hear that? You want help tonight? What are you going to do? You're going to humble yourself. Under the mighty hand of God, as James says, and he will exalt you in due time. God gives grace to thee, to the humble. Yeah. I'm unworthy of all the uh, chassid in Hebrew, loving kindness, and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant, for with my staff only I crossed the Jordan, and now I become two companies. Uh, deliver me, I pray from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers and the children. For you said, I will prosper you. God loves to hear his word read back to him, by the way. Do you read the Bible back to God? And back to Jesus, his son? Do you? Get in the habit. They love to hear the word read back to them because it proves that you're seeing it, you're reading it, you're understanding it. God, he's telling God, this is your promise, Lord, to me, Yahweh to me. Isn't that great? And Jacob's greatly afraid. People, when things don't make any sense, look up here, please. When things don't make any sense, that's the point at which you raise your hand. You say, this, this is nonsense, but I'm trusting you anyway. That is when your faith goes, the roots go deep. Not when everything's going fine and you're, you know, winning the, the Powerball lottery. You shouldn't be playing it anyway. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Right? Not when everything's great. People are sending you checks. You're getting raises at work. Your faith is not going to deepen that much. But it's when God is making total nonsense of your life that you still lift your hands and you start singing. Right? People, he humbles himself. Write down Micah 719, what's required of a man. Anybody know the verse? Anybody know? What does God require of thee? I'm sorry? I'm giving you a chance to preach, and you don't even want to preach. Let's turn to it. Micah 719 says what? Very, very key verse. That when we do the things that God, God loves us to do, well, then he will again have compassion on us. And look at he will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You know that your sins have been cast in the deepest parts of God's ocean? So why bring them up to yourself? Why bring up your past failures? Right? Why bring up your past failures? A lot of times it's the enemy doing it. Don't let them. Bind them up. I've got to go quick. F.W. Borm is a Christian. He was a pastor in England, and he was a Christian short, short essayist that uh, Dr. Ravi Zacharias loves to read. Get him, gets himself thinking, he said, and, and from different, different angles and so. But Borm talks about being in Scotland with the shepherd. And they had a lot of gates before they got to this big barn. And... Bar Dr. Barham, Pastor Barham was invited to a church and he was regretting should I have taken it. He stayed where he was. And this old shepherd told him, he says, he says uh, Dr. Barham, he says, a long time ago when I started shepherding sheep, I learned to close the gates behind me. You see all the gates we've just closed? There's a reason, because the sheep are ahead of us and we want to make sure they don't go back. Stop it. You need to close the gate on that church. Ladies and gentlemen, how many gates you need to close? It's time to close the gates and leave them closed. Now, don't go back there. Paul says in, in Philippians 3, write it down, 13 and 14, he says, I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end 
of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, the Father, and most of the time when, you know, Paul writes, when he says God, it's God the Father. It's not God the Son, the Lord Jesus. Look at the context. Most of the time it's Lord, it's the Lord Jesus. Not all the time. Which God, the Father, through Jesus Christ is calling us. Write down 2 Peter 3.18. You know it. You don't have to go to it. 2 Peter 3.18. Peter, who well know God's grace, right? Who well know, well knew the Son of God's grace, right? He denied him three times, even that he was a friend of his. Then Jesus reinstates him in John 21. In front of the disciples. But can be continually growing in What? In grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People, when people, other people see you, they should think grace. So get in the word, study grace, learn grace, love grace, live grace. Because people, what's the only reason you're saved is because of grace. Say, Pastor, what's grace? Um, unconditional, undeserved favor. Any, anyone here deserve God's grace? No. The more deliverance you get, the more, the more you're going to see how many demons are there and how much healing you need and how much grace you needed. Be a person of grace. Be a Christian of grace. So when someone does you harm, does you wrong, show grace. Tonight. Come after, come after, go out, pursue. Go after demons of evil memory recall. Brooding. Am I the only one here that broods on things that people have done bad to me? Or do you? Oh, we have two of us here. Now we have three. Four? Five. Can I get 110, 120, 130? Oh, we're not, this is an auction. Grace. And when you hold a grudge towards someone, I don't care if it's your part, marriage partner, I don't care if it's your child or your children, I don't care if it's your boss at work, I don't care who it is. Remember how much grace heaven's shown you. And then you'll think, oh, this really isn't that much. And then do something nice for the person. Abraham Lincoln said the greatest thing to do with an enemy is make him into a friend. Amen? Are we awake? I close with this. Anybody ever heard of a woman named Annie Johnston Flint? You ever heard of her? Raise your hand. Annie Johnston Flint. Brother Phil loves to sing. Phil Wama. I have tender memories of him singing with Pastor, for Pastor Worley before he got up to speak. And Brother Phil, I'm surprised. Phil, you know the song that she wrote. Annie Johnston Flint, listen to this. Compared to her, you have no problems. Zero. No do I. She was orphaned at a very young age. Her name? Annie Johnston Flint. She was totally crippled by rheumatoid arthritis. Most of her life she spent with six pillows in a bed, having to be turned over because of bed sores. Gee, how's your life stacking up? In the later years of her life, she got cancer. You want to hear the words of this hymn that she penned? Philip, you know it. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he adds his mercy. 
To multiply trials, he multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed before the day is even half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, God the Father's full giving is only begun. People, how much did he love you? He gave his only begotten son. His love is no limit. Is it ringing a bell for? His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, his son, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Isn't that powerful? I hope you never forget Annie Johnston Flint. The next time you're having a rough day and the coffee is not hot at McDonald's and you're complaining or the kids or grandkids left a toy on the floor and you tripped over it in the middle of the night, remember Annie Johnston Flint. He giveth more grace. Isn't God good?